Hall. He's our presenter tonight on IPv6. Uh, take it away, Jim. Right, Mug 2015, January. All right, welcome. So I wanted to start with a brief introduction. Um, I got really kind of uh, interested in IPv6 in around 2008, and I started putting serious time into it in uh, 2010. And looking back, if I would have known that uh, we'd only be where we're at right now, <laughs> I don't know if I would have spent as much time as I did in 2010. So um, it kind of brings me to the topic of this presentation, which is um, IPv6 is, is an interesting <coughs> challenge because I think everybody, uh, most people that have spent any time with it know that it's necessary, but it's, it's one of those things that's so <coughs> basic. It's like a platform that it's hard, it's hard to figure out how do you think of it. Where does it fit? Um, I think a lot of things today uh, are thought of as products, right? I buy a product, I buy a solution, it does X, I figure out how to you know, integrate it to my infrastructure and away I go. And that totally doesn't work for this. Uh, this, this is more like a platform, like, more like something like Java or Cloud or something like that. And uh, it's, it's a little strange because since it's a platform, it's really plumbing, it's infrastructure. There's no immediate benefit. So I think that's why we're kind of, um, we're making progress, but we're stuck a little in terms of, you know, if I'm looking at my company or my business, and I'm looking at opportunities, I'm thinking, okay, if I'm gonna put time into something, what's the payoff? What's the benefit? What, what do I get? Right? And if, if it's something like infrastructure, almost like electricity or water or HVAC, I mean, that's typically not in the purview of IT, right? That, that's not the kind of thing I worry about. And actually, those are the areas where IPv6 is coming. So that, that makes this guy interesting. And when I was thinking about this, um, you know, I've been giving these talks since, uh, lots of talks since 2011. And, uh, like I said, we've made some progress, but it's been pretty slow. And uh, really, the, the challenge with IPv6, I mentioned this to Jim a little, it's not so much a technical problem, because if you look on the internet, I mean, there's lots of books. I mean, pick your favorite vendor, pick your favorite product. I mean, there's whole books on how to configure it, how to do it. That, that you know, we'll go through a little of that, but that's not really the problem. The problem is, why? Why would I want to do this, right? How many people have less than 10 priorities they're looking at right now in terms of like technologies they want to do, products, to-do lists, whatever, right? So I mean, this is just not high on the list, right? And it's kind of interesting, you know, maybe like DNSSEC, you know, I, you know, we should do it, it's kind of nice, but... But it's also another problem in that, like my provider still doesn't have me hooked with IPv6 even if I wanted to. Which was your provider? AT&T U-verse. Really? I thought uh, you might have to do it manually, but you should be able to get 6RD. Well, maybe it's my gateway that they supply to it. That's possible. Me. That's possible. It should be possible, but I think we can talk to you a little about Well, you're that. an architect, so you can go fix it. Oh, boy. Yeah, well, you know, even my influence is pretty limited there. Um, so I, I, I guess what uh, when I'm looking at this, I try to think of, you know, how, how can I make this interesting or how can I how can I provide an interesting story or context for where IPv6 is at? And so what I came up with was the matrix. Because if you really, if you look at TCP IP, it's so fundamental. I mean, it's so basic and ingrained in everything we do every day. I mean, our phones, our computer, I mean, our world, right? I mean, can you imagine if I told you that we're yanking out IP and we're putting in a new protocol. And how long would it take you to get everything up and running at home or your company? I mean, it'd be years, I mean, maybe decades, right? So, I mean, when we're talking about messing with that, I mean, that's, it's just, it's, it's scary, it's frightening, it's, it's just, you know, it's like changing your language, right? You just don't want to do it unless you absolutely have to. All right, so the, the, the challenge that we have with IPv6 is, again, with TCP IP, um, you know, there are some 
I, I know there's uh, there's some of us in here that have uh, that actually predate TCP/IP and predate <laughs> the IP internet, right? There, there, there's a few of us, but but there aren't there aren't many. Right? Most people, most people in the industry today have basically grown up with TCP IP and that's all there is. And I can tell you that when I was at, when I, I taught networking for a long time at college and uh, people would usually be really confident until we talked about a non-IP protocol like DECnet or ISIS or IPX and then, then they really had trouble because they're like, well that's not networking, right? Because it's just, it's, everything is IP. So it's, it's hard to see outside of that. And the, the challenge is, we have two things, right? So whenever, whenever we transition from one technology to another, we have to have some kind of a bridge, right? So how, how do we migrate? And so in order to do that, we have solutions to help with the migration, you know, gateways, translation, proxies, things like that. The problem is, the more we extend things, the more we come up with all these gateways <coughs> and things like that, it's almost like we're creating a disincentive for people to migrate, right? Because I don't really have to migrate, I'm gonna get this proxy or this gateway, or and we just build up all this inertia. So it, it, it makes it harder. And then what, what we've reached today is, and I don't think we're gonna be stuck there forever, but, but we are going kind of slow, is we've reached this impasse where most people still don't want to make the switch. So um, at the same time, we, we basically have a protocol that was not designed for global internet. And so it's, it's totally stretched. And so in order to survive, now we have to do what's called CGN or cascading net. And we keep rolling out more and more of that. And we've kind of created this illusion where I talk to some of my friends that, that do this and they're like, well, you know, my customer is going to look at IPv6 in 10 years, which, which I'll tell you right now. <laughs> so, so let me let me say something else too. So you guys aren't paying me, right? So I'm going to be I'm going to be pretty frank. <laughs> so I hope nobody's easily offended because <laughs> I'm I'm not going to feed it to you gently. So 10 years is a pipe dream, okay? IPv4 doesn't have that kind of lifespan left in it to support the kind of demands we're putting on it. However, because because we've done such a good job at extending it, we've created this illusion that everybody is convinced that, you know, yeah, I should do IPv6, but I'm gonna do it next year. I'm gonna do it, the, I'm gonna do it in five years, I'm gonna do it in 10 years, you know, I'm gonna come back to it. So I wanna talk a little bit about this and uh, what I see missing, so I, you know, I go to a lot of conferences, I talk to a lot of people, I work with a lot of people, um, you know, I've seen, and it done hundreds of technical presentations, right? So again, I mean, if you guys are looking for technical content, there's tons of stuff. I mean, if there's something specific you're looking for, ask me, I point you in the right direction. Tons of free material, right? So this is not a technical problem. Really to me, and this goes back to kind of being a teacher and a consultant, I think the problem here is we're not looking at the fundamentals. <coughs> I want to take a little time and talk about you know, what, what's the problem, right? I mean, can somebody tell me what, what's the problem with IPv4? Why, why would we migrate away from it? Number of addresses available. Number of addresses, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Most why, of the workarounds are all to, you know, we used to have one, one IP per website. Now we've, you know, using DNS uh, with Apache, you can have multiple address, multiple on the there. We've solved the SSL problem with it, but like you said, it's a patchwork to try and figure out how we can fix something versus moving over to IPv6, which would solve the problem where you just one-to-one -one all the different uh, sites and so, computers and networks. So I don't, I don't want to get stuck in this too much, but um, you know, if, if I'm going to play skeptic, uh, I would say, well, we've had NAT forever, we have PBXs, why, why can't we just use PBX-like systems? What's the problem with that? <coughs> why, why, why do we need unique addressing? Why is that a bit, who cares? What's, what's the value? See, that's the problem. Can anybody give me a good answer? Directly connectable. Yeah, as I said, you directly can't directly connect to. That's true, but you can, you can get around it, right? See, this is the issue, is I, I don't think there are good answers to that question. So <laughs> I, I, wanna, I wanna kinda step back a little. Uh, so I hope you guys like this. And 
and uh, I hope this is valuable. I want to kind of step back a little and talk about why, what is the value of an addressing system? Because this is kind of looking at something like the grid. You know, why do we need the grid? And you, just, you just don't think about it, right? I mean, it's just a given. But I, I think in order to make this transition, we have to look a little about, look a little at these details and figure out how are they useful. So if you look at the purpose of an addressing system, the, these are the main goals that it's trying to serve. So uniqueness, right? The idea is that everything should be addressable. I should be able to uniquely identify all the nodes on my network. Um, we'll, we'll come back to why that's useful later on. Topology, right? In fact, a lot of people would argue that it's a mistake to have identity and topology overloaded into the same semantic construct. So there's, so there's a lot of things like lists that are whole interesting other talks to, you know, to try and split that up to, to make things uh, more modular. But for now, typically addressing systems combine both of those. Registration. Right? If I have to find the person who owns this, how, how do I look them up? You know, for troubleshooting, things like that. Routability, which means can I reach them? How do I get to them? And finally, and this is a big one that we've really lost sight of, is operational simplicity. So one thing that everybody agrees on, that, that's, that's, you know, everybody keeps talking about, is in the next five to 10 years, we're gonna have orders of magnitude <coughs> and increases of the node count. So how many people think they're going to get an order of magnitude more staff to support those devices? <laughs> Nobody, right? So then we better make sure that it's operationally simple, right? If it's complicated, then it's going to be hard to manage. All right, so I'm not going to belabor this. I think this is a good reference thing. Um, but if I look at IPv4, I, this drives me nuts. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm an engineer. I'm kind of anal. So it drives me nuts when I see all different kinds of numbers. So if we look at IPv4, um, and I'll skip this just to save time, but the bottom line is usable address space, we have about 3.7 billion. So if anybody's curious why that's all the detail, all the relevant RFCs, this is a hyperlink that goes over the IANA, uh, the IANA special purpose addresses if you're curious because that does change from time to time. But that's it. So that, that's because I, 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 every day I see a different number, but that's the actual number. So. Um, if, if I look at this, um, how do I figure out what's on the internet? So, so there's a couple different ways. One way is I can look in DNS. I can say, what are all the FQDNs in DNS? And if I look at that, I'm at almost 1.1 billion. That's one measure. Um, another measure is, what are unique nodes on the internet? Right? Not quite the same as FQDN. This is a little more pervasive. And this is what's growing geometrically. Right, so we have all these things coming online. So the, the, the challenge that um, nobody really looks at too much yet is we're going to 50 billion nodes in the next five years with an addressing system that's designed for 3.7. And that's not including any kind of overhead or networking or anything like that. That's just raw numbers. So that's a challenge. All right, so um, looking at this mathematically, and again, I'll not spend a lot of time about this, but I thought this was kind of interesting. When we look at addressing systems, there's been lots of addressing systems, right? There's been lots of phone numbering systems. There's been lots of other protocols besides IP. There's been lots of attempts at how do I create an addressing system and use it, and when does it no longer work or no longer serve me because it's too inefficient, right? So if you look at this RFC, Somebody wrote this and spent a lot of time thinking about what makes sense in an addressing system. You know, how much can I get out of it, right? Because I might have 3.7 billion addresses, but I can't actually use all of them. There has to be some overhead for networking, for moving stuff around, for transit, for things like that. So the number, actually, if you look at, and, and this is a good read, if you look at all the systems, they came up with a system where you basically do the log of the, um, how many nodes you have versus the theoretical capacity. And that creates what's called the HD ratio. And typically, well, before IPv4, you never want to go over 87% because it just gets too painful. So what's interesting is we're actually at 94. <laughs> and uh, I don't think anybody will be surprised by this, right? I mean, obviously, if we're doing cascading that, then you know the system is, is pretty straight. But Again, I just throw this out there because one thing that I like people to think about is 
when, you, when we're choosing to stay with IPv4, nobody talks about what are the costs, right? Because every decision has a cost. And if we're using a system that's completely inefficient and not designed for what it's doing, there's a cost with that, which means we're choosing to allocate our time and money to make this work. Which, now, I'm not questioning that today, but as we keep going, right, and I'm gonna show you some of the costs, you have to start asking yourself, is that really where I want to put my time and money, or would I rather put it somewhere else? Okay, so oversubscription, right? So we're long past this. I mean, this is old news, that uh, we don't have enough addresses. Right, right now we have about 14 and a half billion unique nodes on the internet. So we're oversubscribed by about four to one. So we have to have NAT. In fact, one layer of NAT is not enough. We have to have two layers of NAT, you know, and maybe maybe three. Mm -hmm. So that's just the given. That's old news. I'm not going to you know spend any more time on that. But there are there are some sacrifices because we have to have that. We can no longer have unique addresses. <coughs> we can't have topological location or not unique, and registration is difficult. Right? So things like security are a major challenge. Right? A big problem with the internet, security is tough because I can't uniquely identify people, things fluctuate all the time. So it creates a lot of interesting challenges. The, the other interesting challenge it creates is when I have these multiple layers of NAT, it makes it much more challenging to have an advanced application. So, um, if you look at deploying CGN to, to keep stretching IPv4, um, what's interesting is, and again, I don't want to turn this into a network presentation, but, but just at a high level, all the ISPs that are doing or have done CGN, they've all reached the same conclusion. This is not a good technology. It creates a lot of problems. It costs a lot of money to support. And the best that we can hope for when we deploy CGN as a carrier is we're only slightly degrading the user experience. So if I'm an ISP and I'm deploying this to stretch out IPv4 so I can keep servicing customers, it costs me a lot of money to deploy it. It costs me a lot of money to support it. I have to potentially buy more IP addresses on the open market. And the users don't like it, right? And how much more are you going to pay for degraded service? <laughs> right? You see the problem with that business model? So again, the, the, there's, there's a cost problem with this in the long term. All right, so th this is something that I don't think I've ever seen covered, um, unless it's covered in development sessions. So I just wanted to mention this. So I'll, most of the costs are known. On the infrastructure side, you know, there's hundreds of presentations talking about all the problems with CGN, so I'm not going to beat that to death. Um, but what I don't see people talk about <coughs> is, in order to make all of our modern applications work with these layers of NAT, we have to have frameworks. And these frameworks are extremely complex, right? Has anybody looked at WebRTC? So that, that, that's something that's gaining a lot of popularity to try and facilitate interactive communication, two-way video, things like that. But if you actually look at that spec, it's really <coughs> complex because we have to support going through all these layers of NAT, which is actually surprisingly difficult. So we have three general frameworks that the ITF came up with, Stun, Turn, and Ice. And, and these are basically frameworks or, or uh, kind of a whole uh, set of standards that I can use to basically make my interactive application work through NAT. So interactive being audio, like SIP, right? So when I make a voice call, um, almost for sure it's SIP, right? Uh, the, the old TDM stuff is going away. So I know I can tell you AT&T's goal is to kill it by 2020. I think the European Union is similar, right? Where it's going to be no more TDM, it'll all be IP based because there's no reason to keep TDM around. Right, so SIP is an interactive application. It requires an incredibly complex framework to work through that. Video, same thing. Video, very complex. Any kind of a gaming uh, system. And gaming isn't just for fun, for like, you know, World of Warcraft and stuff like that. Actually, it's a huge area for training. Right, people have discovered that if you make training interesting, then people like to do it more and actually do it. <coughs> so all of these things are required and the other big problem is that there isn't really, a, there's no silver bullet. So let's say I'm creating a new application and I need to support NAT. 
It's not like I can just get like the stun framework or the turn framework or the ice framework and use it. It's just a, re it's, it's almost like a development language, right? It's a set of standards, but you have to make it work for your application. So if you go and look at SIP or all the other protocols, each one has its own variant. It's constantly updated, constantly new cases, new standards. So all of this, there's no value add here, right? There's, the only benefit is this lets our, our applications work through net. And we're talking about thousands of pages that's constantly updated. There's whole companies that all they do is help you make this work, right? So I mean, that's where we're at. So I'm not, I'm not saying it's good or it's bad. It's just that this needs to be factored in in our decision to keep IPv4 around because this, this is the price we're paying. All right, so I'm, I'm gonna kind of skip through this, right? So pretty much everybody's doing it and this is what we have to do to make it work, right? We have to make sure that, we, you know, addressing has not been unique for a long time, so you can't use addressing and you have to make sure your logging includes five tuple, right? So there's <coughs> uh, source and destination address and port in the protocol and it has to be timestamped with something like MTP because that constantly rolls over, right? So you're doing all this. Um, I guess the only thing that uh, um, the only thing that, that I'll mention here is uh, it does surprise me that um, in my consulting with customers, I still see a lot of people that in their security or in their application, they still assume that addressing is unique, and they'll tell me, "Well, you know, I'm not going to IPv6." Okay, that's fine, but you know, addresses aren't unique anymore. CGN is pervasive all over the place. Not, not just in the US, in all the countries that it's being rolled out. So how are you dealing with that? Well, I don't want to deal with IPv6. Okay, that's great. <laughs> how are you dealing with addresses aren't unique, right? So, so again, regardless of what you do, these problems with IPv4 still exist and have to be addressed. Okay, so the other thing too is, I, I always get this comment is, you know, can we just keep it around for 10 years or forever? So if we just, constrain ourselves to the traditional view, right? So PT PCs, laptops, tablets, servers, smartphones, basically all your human interaction devices, devices that were made to deal with people. If we just, because that's really all most people talk about, if that's all we talk about, we can probably stretch it out for at least another five plus years. And I think, I think that's the focus, right? You know, you, you could argue that, but I think it's at least possible. So, in, in, terms, in terms of this, there, there are some challenges that I want to talk through. All right, so before, before I move forward, this is kind of, kind of curious with this. How far, question? Well, actually, I still, I think there's a problem with that in that, I mean, people aren't going to just settle for the devices you mentioned because, like, people are going to want their smart TVs and their Blu-ray players and all that so that they can watch their Netflix or whatever as well, so. I That's mean, true. <laughs> so let me, let me come back to that because I'm actually going to talk about CES, which, which is along that line. Um, so th this is just out for, for my curiosity because I, I still hear a lot of skepticism, is um, I'm always curious uh, when, when people tell me that, you know, I'm not going to do IPv6, how far do you think we can stretch IPv4? And there isn't a right answer. That this is just curious. So, um, right, like I said, right now we're at about 14.5 billion unique, uh, unique nodes on the Internet, an addressing system designed for 3.7 billion nodes. So, how many people think we can get it to 10 to 1? So, with 37 billion nodes on the internet, we're still going to make IPv4 work. I, mean, it's, I think it's, it's probably doable. By the way, how, how long do you think it is until we get to 37 billion nodes? Anyone want to guess? 14 and a half now? Three uh, years? Yeah, probably three, 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 three or four years. Yeah. yeah, it's like two and a half times what we have now. Yeah. Okay, what about, anybody think we can get to 100 billion? <laughs> no, or or no. 100 times? Nobody? I'll bet there's somebody who really thinks that they can. All right, so the, the reason I go through this it's is painful to do you cook. Yeah, I, I, I actually wonder how far I could stretch it. But the reason I go through this is what's missing from most conversations 
is what's called the Internet of Things. <laughs> so remember, I said that when everybody's thinking about IPv6, they're thinking of traditional devices, right? Devices that I, as a person, use. But that's really the minority of the Internet, right? Or, or it will be shortly. So where all the action is, is in basically what's called M to M, or machine to machine. So these are devices like uh, microcontrollers, sensors, actuators, things that monitor the environment and either record what's going on or, or can possibly take action, right? And these are everywhere. And what's happening is this is getting deployed all over the place. And right now, if I look at all those types of all those device categories, not all of them are networked, although a high percentage of them are. What's happening though is by 2020, the, the integration costs are getting so cheap that by 2020, it, it'll just be ubiquitous. So every sensor, every actuator, every microcontroller, CPU, everything is just gonna have built-in networking. Because it'll be so cheap to do it, it'll, it'll just be automatic. Which means that all of this stuff can potentially come online. Yeah, but those can run IPv6 while other devices run IPv4. That's, that's true. Let me, let me come back to that. It's an excellent point. So, um, just so again, so this this is um, I don't know, I don't know how many people here deal outside of traditional IT stuff. So I'm not going to assume anybody has a background. So just to give you some perspective, if we look at something like microcontrollers, right now we're shipping almost 20 billion units globally, new new units per year, right? And that's that's increasing exponentially. So that's net new. Right, if we look at sensors and actuators, we see a similar story. And there's other types too. So these are net new devices that are becoming uniform or universally networked that are basically just continuously being added. Where are you getting your numbers? Um, I can I can give you a link. There's yeah. it's basically like uh, it's a, it's a bar. It specializes in remember, ICIR or something like that. But it's, it's actually, it's pretty, if you Google it, there's a lot of them. Okay, so that, those are easy. So this one, this one is challenging those numbers, right? Uh, if, you, if you Google those numbers, I guarantee you they're easy to find. But this is from Stanford University. And they're basically saying, we don't believe those numbers. Because if, if you go to this red part over here, this growth of sensors and actuators was totally unexpected. Because if you look at the projections like this, what's this based on? Past history. Yeah. That's right. It's based on past history, and it's based on what the analysts can see now. But well, what's the problem with that? It's not going to work that way. Yeah, you can't, you can, yeah, right? You can't, you can't see how things are going to develop. You can't see new products, new areas, <coughs> emerging markets. So what, this, what Stanford is saying is, they're totally missing the bus, and in less than 10 years, we're going to have over a trillion sensors online. <laughs> right? And they're saying, if you go into the 2030s, we're going to approach 100 trillion sensors online. <laughs> and, there's, and, and they're not alone, right? If you look across the board, Bosch, HP, Intel, Texas Instruments, Cisco, GE, all these companies think like this is it. Um, all the consulting firms, Gartner, McK McKinsey, they all think that this, this is the future, right? So what's interesting is, and this is going back to that, um, give me one second and I'll answer your question, is uh, what's interesting is if you look at IPv4, right? I think most people are thinking, yeah, the number of devices is maybe going to increase like 20 or 30 or 40% a year. But the problem is that's just looking at traditional devices. That's not factoring in this. So th this is, I, I guess what, I'm, what, I'm, what I want to present here tonight is, basically IPv4 is not going to survive this. So th this is what's going to force a change. Question. All right, so, so yeah, there are a lot of sensors, a lot of things coming out. I mean, the lawnmower, automated lawnmower, automated <laughs> note blower, what, what have you. Um, you know, and it, but, but all of those things are, going to be behind, you know, the, the home network. So it, it's not that they're all going to be exposed mm -hmm. to, the, to the internet. They're all going to be sort of intraneted. Uh, it's not, it's, 
So, so that's so that's true for a lot of things, um, like especially if I say consumer category. Um, but Even from a security perspective, you've got to hide all that stuff. Um, well, I don't. I don't. Uh, security is an excellent topic, but I I want to keep us somewhat focused just because of time. L let me come back to that. Um, but 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 I do agree for consumer for consumer type stuff. You could make a pretty good case that a lot of that's going to be behind the gateway. I don't care. Right. But but everything I'm going to talk about is is mostly outside the consumer space. So um, what what types of examples of uh, you know 